Strategic Missions Partners, he and uh, his wife Linda, and um, what they do with Next Level International. Some of you may remember last fall, uh, Meg and I actually had the opportunity to tr- travel to Europe to take part in the Next Level International Conference Missions uh, conference thing. And, and so, yeah, so these are just great friends of Megan and I, as well as of our church. And I know that Linda's uh, father just passed away this week, so she wasn't, um, isn't going to be able to be with us today. But Bill said, I'm coming. And I'm going to, he said, he's going to bring the, the best message he's ever preached in his life this morning. So uh, we're really, uh, can you welcome Bill Hollis as he comes to share the word with us today? Good morning. You know, I'd like to bring you a good report about your pastor and his wife at that conference in October. I'd like to bring you a good report, of, <clears throat> but I just can't. Bible says we can't lie, and so I can't lie. No, actually, we had a great time with them. We didn't any of us realize um, how far the hotel was from where the venue was. And is in a town called Coventry, England, which during World War II was virtually leveled. So after the war, they had to rebuild it, and they hired like a really ugly architect. (laughs) And so it's like gerbil runs trying to get there. So I don't know. I think most of us, did you guys ever get lost? Okay, we got lost multiple times. But anyway, hey, it's really good to be here. Thank you. As Scott said, my wife's dad just passed away earlier this week. Um, He had lived with us for a while, and then he got so bad, we had to put him in a a, um, group home for dementia patients. And uh, this is a guy who, he just loved God, and it was amazing to hear all of the people, all of the testimonies. In fact, it was quite humbling to hear all of the testimonies about what people thought of my father-in-law. I knew him as a great man. I knew him as a great believer. I knew him as a great dad, all of those things. But person after person after person, if you happen to follow my wife, especially on Facebook, you will know that between, um, between her father's death and um, the queen um, celebrating her diamond jubilee, I think that probably Facebook crashed yesterday. <laughs> Out in, maybe you were given a mag, did, did you get this, anybody get this? Okay, this is a magazine that we put out every year. This is the newest one, and it kind of tells what we do. For those of you that don't know, uh, Nexel International works all across the continent of Europe. We have historically done three things. We've planted churches and trained leaders and mobilized people just like you and me to do mission work across the continent. Now things are kind of changing a little bit, and I'll tell you some of that in the, in the coming moments. Um, we're getting involved in a lot of different things, including trying to help rescue and train people who otherwise would have been um, victims of human trafficking. Linda, my wife, is going to Moldova this next year. In the country of Moldova, the poorest country in all of Europe, if you're an orphan, and in that country, like Romania, many orphans, because the government used to pay you if you had six children minimum. Now, Scott and Megan were trying to go for six and then just kind of, you know, chickened out there. But but six children, and the government would give you money to care for those kids. Well, that was under communism. When communism fell, people would literally take their children to orphanages, drop them off, and drive away because they couldn't afford it anymore. And so in the country of Moldova, which I said is the poorest country in all of Europe, there are orphanages all over. Here's what happens, though, and I'm thinking of this in terms of these kids graduating from high school. If you're 16 years old, you're kicked out of the orphanage, you're given 30 U.S. dollars, the equivalent, and a bus ticket back to your home, even if there's nobody back at your home. And so you can imagine what happens. It's why Moldova is one of the most um, key, horrible, whatever places for human trafficking. Because these girls get back to their hometown. They don't know anybody. They have $30. That runs out really quick. Someone drives up in a car and says, do you need a job, honey? You look lost. 
I know somebody who needs a housekeeper. I know somebody who needs a nanny. I know somebody who needs, and they get in a van or they get in a car, and for the next month or so, they're in a warehouse experiencing a hell that you and I could not ever begin to imagine. This summer, London will host the Olympics. And just this past week, they announced that they're going to have to fly more workers in the industry, trying to be mindful of the kids in the room, because they don't have enough. And all I could think of when I heard that is these girls in Moldova and these girls in Slovakia and these girls in the Czech Republic just thinking, I wonder how many of them are being kidnapped today to be a part of that. And so while we continue to train leaders and continue to help plant churches, it just seems like the Lord has opened doors for us to get involved in some other things. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later on. But today I want to talk to you starting with a story out of John's uh, Gospel, Chapter 8. And this is probably without question one of my, if not my favorite story in the entire New Testament. John chapter 8, and I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation today. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crown suit gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I find that to be a powerful story on so many levels. <clears throat> it really reveals a lot about the heart of a religious person. Because here this woman was, and yes, while what she was doing was wrong and it was sinful, and the law of Moses did say she should be stoned for it, the law of Moses also said that the man involved should be stoned for it. But we don't read anything about him in this story. They bring this woman, they throw her down in front of Jesus, and they say, what do you say? The law says she should be stoned. And the Bible says that Jesus doesn't take the bait. He doesn't immediately turn to the woman and start to berate her for her sin. He doesn't encourage the crowd to find good stones so we can do a good job of this. He just bends down and begins to write in the dirt. Now, we don't know what he wrote. Then, if you've ever heard anybody say, well, this is what he wrote, they don't know. The Bible doesn't say. He could have written nothing. He could have just been doodling in the dirt. He could have been making stick figures for all we know. He could have been writing down, don't forget to get milk on the way home. You know, we don't, we don't know what he wrote. I think what probably this was about was Jesus was just allowing the weight of the moment to come into this situation. Because I don't know about you, but I find that unfortunately, I can be pretty quick to judge people. I can be pretty quick to get all righteous about their sin. But then as time goes on, the Holy Spirit starts speaking to my heart and reminding me about my stuff. And suddenly I find that maybe I'm just not so convinced of my purity and their sinfulness. Well, one by one, they leave, beginning with the oldest, until it's just Jesus and the woman. And one of the other reasons I find this story so interesting is because of what doesn't happen here. Jesus says to the woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there's no one here left to accuse me. And so Jesus says, kneel down, 
pray this prayer, fill out this card, take this track, and become a Christian. He doesn't do that. He simply says, neither do I condemn you. Go. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. What happens when Jesus brings his grace and mercy into our life and speaks the go to us? The first go that Jesus speaks, go and sin no more. Now, this woman had probably not been brought up in much of a faith situation for some time. Maybe she had as a child. After all, she was Jewish. She was in a country that, you know, valued religion very, very greatly. It was actually part of the fabric of their, their culture. So maybe she knew some of the things of God, although as a woman, she likely was not deliberately taught the Bible or the, the Old Testament would be their Bible. So we don't know that, but we do know this. We do know that Jesus says to her, go and sin no more. So I think that implies go and grow. Go and learn how to sin no more. Go and and become more because I'm giving you the opportunity. I'm giving you freedom. I'm giving you a chance to become more than you've seen yourself as. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but my experience is that you and I can be very, very slow to forget others' failures. You ever have this experience happen? Someone comes in the church and someone says, hey, look, it's so-and-so. And you go, who's that? And they go, do you remember? She's the girl who. He's the guy who. It's like for some reason, we just find it so much easier to define ourselves and define, to define others according to our sin. Instead of going, that's the girl who Jesus just passionately and powerfully loves. Well, that doesn't distinguish her from anybody. You're right, because Jesus passionately and powerfully loves everybody. But... But it is important for us, if we're going to live any kind of a victorious Christian life, that we not just simply receive the forgiveness, the starting point of a life of faith, but that we do go and grow. I'm always interested. Every time I'm in a church, I always want to find out, how can people in this church go and grow? Starting point. This is an introduction to the history, values, and vision of Pathway. You'll explore how this church is set up and discover what it means to be a member. In other words, a, a central part of the life of this body. Life groups. Life groups are an integral part of Pathway, offering a variety of opportunities to connect with others. Contact Jason Brooks, but don't call him on his home phone number. He'll be at Scott's Eating Hot Dogs. <laughs> Gift discovery. Using various assessment tools, this class is designed to help you discover. There are just so many ways that you, there's the word of God. There's your own engagement with the word of Go and grow. I was reading a book recently, and uh, this pastor had written this book, and he was telling a story about one of his guys uh, on his team who came and, and, and said, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm going to be leaving the church. He said, really? Why? He goes, well, I'm just, and you've never heard this, okay? You've never heard this, so you might want to write this down because you've never heard this. This is going to come as such an absolute shock to you. You've never heard this. Get your pencil out because you'll, you'll want to keep track. You may again someday hear this one time in your life. The guy says, because I'm, quote, not being fed here. Never heard that, but it, there are people who will say that. It's happened in the history of Christianity. This is probably the second or third time it ever happened. Um, I'm not being fed here. And the pastor, the pastor says to this guy, and I like this kind of pastor because this would be me. The pastor says to him, he goes, man, he says, I'll tell you what. Why don't you take the next month and every day spend some time in the Word? Just spend some time in the Word. And in a month, come back, and we'll talk. And if you still feel like you're not being fed, then I will actually bless you and help you as you move on. 
then the pastor writes in the book, he goes, see, here's why I approach it like that. Because I know in my life that if I ever went home and told my wife, I'm leaving you. And she said, why? And I said, because I'm not being fed around here. She would say, all right, you're an adult. In the other room is a refrigerator full of food. Get up off your ample and get in there and make yourself a sandwich and leave me alone. You know, that is, we have to be willing to take responsibility for our own growth, right? I have three grandchildren, the oldest of whom is three. I'm more than happy to get them a number of things. But as they get older, more and more they hear grandpa say, uh, no, you can do that for yourself. Because when they're one, yeah, you just want to do it. When they're two and they ask you, would you get that for me, Papa? Oh, it just melts your heart. But you know, by the time they're 10, <laughs> when they're going, could you just get me a glass of water? So go and grow. Yeah, get involved in the word, get involved in prayer, and then get involved with other believers who will encourage you, who will help you, who will hold you accountable. You know, this church, I mean, I, I just, I bless your pastor. I bless the team. I bless everybody who's involved in ministry because they're doing things to help you and your family grow. So if you're not growing today, let me tell you, there's a refrigerator full of food. The second go that Jesus tells us about is to go and testify. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Sometimes we believe that until we reach some level of maturity, God can't use us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Again, as a pastor for 27 years, I had a lot of people who I would say to me, well, pastor, I just don't feel adequate enough. I don't think I know the Bible well enough. I don't think I'm mature enough to really share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. But as soon as I do feel like I'm, then I, the next chapter in the gospel of John, the chap, chapter nine is the story of a man born blind. And the disciples are walking by and the young man wants to be healed. And the disciples ask Jesus who sinned this young man or his parents that he's blind. Because obviously, in our human way of reasoning, there has to be a cause and effect to everything. And so this has to be somebody's fault. And Jesus goes, actually, yeah, this isn't about his sin or his parents' sin. This is just so that God's glory can be manifested in his life right here, right now. So, the guy gets healed. Now, here's what happens when God does something in your life. The people you know are going to fall into one of three categories. There are going to be those people who just absolutely are ecstatic over the fact that God has touched you. I mean, there are just going to be those people who are thrilled to death that God has healed you, that God has forgiven you, that God has given you a new job, you know, gotten you a job somehow, you know, you're out of your work, out of work, whatever, that your marriage has been restored. I mean, there are people who are going to be thrilled to death for you. But then there are going to be people who are going to doubt. They're going to be cynical. Oh, come on. How do you really know that's God? And then there are going to be those people for whatever reason, it's just going to tick them off. Because they're like, why would God give you a job and not give me a job? Why would God heal your child and not heal my child? Why would God, because we just have, well, that's what happens here. There are people who are excited about the young man. There are people in his own hometown who go, hey, isn't that the blind guy who used to beg? And people are like, no, that can't be him. That just doesn't happen. And then there's the religious leaders, the people who are ticked off, right? 
this shouldn't happen for you. You're just some guy. We're the special people. We're the chosen people. We're God's favorites. How come good things aren't happening to us? And so they call the young man in. Now, remember, we're talking about going and testifying of the goodness of God in your life. They call this young man in and they go, dude, are you the guy who was blind? And he goes, yeah. And now you claim to be able to see. Yeah. How did this happen? He says, man, I was sitting there, guy comes by, uh, you know, whatever. They don't like that answer. They don't want this guy to give glory to God. And, you know, you know, just like I do, there are people out there who they just don't want us to give glory to God. Because when you testify of what God has done in your life, your testimony automatically is a question to the person you're sharing with about their own life. You understand what I'm saying? When you talk about what God has done in your life, you're talking about a relationship you have. And that testimony is automatically a question to that other person. And what about you? So they kick the young man out and they bring in his parents. They say to his parents, is this your son? They go, yep, he's our son. They go, was he born blind? Yep, he was born blind. How did this happen? Well, they knew enough to know that these religious people didn't want God to be glorified. They didn't want God. So they go, he's an adult, ask him. Bring the young man back in. Here's where this touches you and it touches me. This is why this is so simple. This is why this is so simple. They ask the young man again, all right, give glory to God. Tell us this guy is a bum, Jesus. Because see, the other thing is, Jesus didn't heal them according to the rules. It was a Sabbath. Jesus had healed this guy on a Sabbath. And the religious leaders, do you remember in the Bible when Peter goes to the home of Cornelius, the Gentile? Do you remember that story? Have you read that story? And he begins to share, and the Bible says that, you know, they, became, they, they, they surrendered their hearts to Christ. In fact, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter goes back to the rest of the boys, the rest of the apostles, because they want to hear why you went to the home of a Gentile. That was against the rules. And Peter said, well, I had this vision, da 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 He says, and I went and I shared with them, and the Holy Spirit fell on them like he fell on us. And the religious people go, yes, but you went into the home of Gentiles. And Peter's kind of like, did you miss the part where they got saved? Yes, but you didn't do it according to the rules. Yeah. Did you hear me when I said that the Holy Spirit fell on them just like he fell on us? See, religious people miss the point all the time. Who cares what you wear when you go to church? Who cares whether you're using an organ or a rock and roll guitar? Who cares whether you're having coffee in the sanctuary or not? Who cares about any of the stuff that religious people care about? This guy goes, look, whether he's a good man or a bad man, I can't tell you. What I can tell you is this. I was blind and now I see. And when Jesus says, go and testify, that's all he's asking us to do. Just be willing to go and tell people, this is what God has done in my life. I already said you should go and grow, but to testify, you don't need to, do, you don't need to know anything other than I was blind and now I see. You go to school. Somebody says, I hear you go to church. Why do you go to church? Because I had a hurt in my heart. Somebody asked me, and now my heart doesn't hurt. Oh, that's a bunch of junk. Look, think what you want. I had a hurt in my heart. I went there. My heart doesn't hurt. I prayed. This happened. We didn't have a job. I prayed. I got a job. Oh, do you really? I was blind. Now I'm seeing. 
That's all it is. So when Jesus says, go and testify, he's saying that to all of us because every one of us who knows Christ as our Savior, every one of us has a testimony. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have the Bible memorized. You don't have to answer everybody's questions. It's okay to go, I don't know. What I do know is I was blind and now I see. And then the third go is the go that we find in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, All authority and in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, there's something about that phrase that we find consistently in the scripture. In Isaiah, we read that passage where speaking of the Messiah, speaking of Jesus, Isaiah the prophet says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Well, that's great. Congratulations. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you. Why? Because he has anointed me. Well, that's fantastic. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you. And he's anointed you. It's like, I went to church today. And we worshiped, and I felt the presence of God. Great. That's fantastic. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. And here's why he did that. So I could preach the good news to the poor. So I could declare freedom for the captive. Sight for the blind. Everything that God does in my life or your life, he does for the good of someone else. We are never the end of the story. Some of you have heard me say this before. We are never the end of the story. We are always just the next point in the story, but there's more points yet to come. So here, Jesus goes, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You do know that Jesus is God, right? You do know that John chapter 1 says that, you know, in the beginning was God. You know, he says the word was with God and was God. So all this authority and power that's been given to Jesus It's not like he was given it because he came to earth for 33 years. It's not even like he was given it because he was such a good teacher. It's not even that he was giving it because he died. It's that he was given it so that he could pour it out onto us. Luke chapter 10, I have given you authority. That's nice. So that you may overcome all the power of the enemy. And so here in 28 of Matthew, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so now as someone with all authority, I am doing two things. Number one, I'm giving you a commandment. Go and make disciples. And number two, I'm giving you the promise that I will be with you in an Acts, he explains what that promise is. It's the Holy Spirit. He says, all authority then has been given to me so that I can do two things. I can give you a mission and I can empower you to accomplish the mission. That's why this authority has been given to me. So number one, Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. In other words, go and grow up. You don't have to live this life, honey. You don't have to live this life. You don't have to do these things. You don't have to wallow in sin. You don't have to be controlled by sin. You don't have to have this brokenness as your constant companion. Go and grow in God. Go and sin no more. And then go and testify. But I don't know that much. Have you experienced the love of God? Yes, that's all you need to do. That's all you need to do to have a testimony. Experience the presence of God. Experience God's love. Experience God's grace. 
And then lastly, go and make disciples. And I'll tell you what, I will actually promise to be with you and empower you as you do it. I was reading the other day this book by a, a guy named Greg Ogden, and he was saying that the statistics show, and I'm not here to be picking on you, but the statistics to show that the uh, Pareto principle, you know what that is? The Pareto principle, it, it just exists across all sorts of platforms, but particularly we're talking about in the church. 80% of the people in, the ch in a local church do 20 uh, do 20% of the work, and 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And there's lots of reasons, but I think sometimes the reason is because we just don't feel adequate. We just don't feel adequate. Like, who am I? What can I do? Well, you can go and you can grow up. You can go and you can testify, and you can go and make disciples. There's a guy named Francis Chan, a little controversial guy, but, but kind of fun. He, uh, he shared this story about making disciples. He said, you know, we somehow have reduced making disciples. Because making disciples is helping people become fully committed and devoted followers of Christ who will reproduce the life of Jesus in them in the life of, of other people who will then turn around and reproduce the life of Christ in them and other people. You can find this. It's really said much better by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where he says, The things you've heard from me go and entrust to, other reli or to reliable people who will be able to entrust it to other reliable people. So Chan says, he goes, You know, suppose my daughter came in and I said to her, Rach, go clean your room. And an hour later... She came back and she goes, hey, Dad, I remember what you told me. In fact, I memorized it. Rach, go clean your room. In fact, Dad, I can actually quote that to you in Greek. <laughs> Dad, you'll be pleased to know that later tonight some of my friends are coming over and we're going to actually have a study on what my room would look like if I cleaned it. Chan's like, you know, if you just read the Bible, you're going to come to this conclusion. We're supposed to be going and making disciples. So I don't know how you're going to do that. I know how the church wants to help you do that. But I don't know how you're going to do that in your own individual life. But let me just, in closing, share with something that God's asked me to do. Last year in September, I was on my way to Europe. I'd had a request from a guy to help plant a church among Roma, or more commonly known as gypsy people. And I I'd kind of brushed off the request, if I'm honest about it, because I, yeah, it's just, yeah, I just, I just brushed it off. And I'm getting ready to go, and I'm spending some time in prayer, and I felt like the Lord said to me, I want you to do something for the Roma people. Now, you have to understand, that is just so stinking uncomfortable for me. Totally different culture. Some of the places where they live, it's like the Stone Age. No electricity, no water. I mean, it's just, they have no, most of them have no spiritual background of any kind. It's just absolutely outside my comfort zone. Give me a room full of leaders and let me train them all day. I'm a happy camper. And so went to the Czech Republic and just went around and started talking to people that I knew, asking them what's happening with the Roma. And come to find out, there isn't, while there's some places where there's a revival, there's just a lot of prejudice even among the church. It kind of made me think if that was what it was like for African American people some time ago, when even Christians, but anyway. So, came back from that, Decided to go back again in November, had to do some other stuff, and in between two things that I had to do, I hopped in the car with a buddy of mine, and we went over and we visited two Roma locations. One, a place called 
Chachitza, and I'm going there in just a few weeks. Chachitza was ruled in the late 1500s by a woman who is still in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific female serial killer in history. The legend is, so that's fact. The legend, whether it's fact or not, I don't know. But the legend is she used to take the blood of young women who were still pure and bathe in it to preserve her youthful appearance. In that town, there's a group of gypsy people that we're working with. And some of them have started to come to Jesus. So we decided we would begin to help them. Went back early in the year and felt like between that time in November and, and then had done some research and, and just came to realize the needs of these people are so great. And so I, I thought I want to meet with the mayor of that city because I want to see what the city's trying to do for the Roma so that we don't duplicate the efforts. But also I just want her to know, hey, we're here to help and you know we just kind of want you to know. We don't want this to be a problem or whatever. And so I asked her, what could we do to bless your city as we're working with these Roma. And she said, you could clean up the illegal garbage dumps that they've created. They have no money. The city wants to charge them to take away their trash, so they don't have the money to pay for that, so they just dump it illegally. So it just adds to this cycle of hatred. The city doesn't like them because they do this. The Roma hate the city because they can't even right now rent a place to have services, to have a meeting, to have a small group. They have to do it in homes because of the prejudice. So in just a couple of weeks, I'm actually taking a group of people from America to go to Slovakia to pick up garbage. Talk about a unique missions trip. Hey, you want to come? It's going to cost you about $2,000, and you're going to get to go pick up trash. But beyond that then as we've continued to do research and find what they need. We've been told again and again, if you're gonna see real cultural change, you've gotta start with the youngest of the young. Here's why. In the country of Slovakia, 10% of the population is Roma, gypsy. 60 plus percent of the children labeled special needs are Roma. Now it's not, it's not because they have a six times incidence of special needs. It's because the white population doesn't want their kids going to school with the Roma. I'll show you a video in just a moment. 10% of the population, as I said, are Roma. As a result of the poverty and the lack of education, they are over 50% of the victims of human trafficking. And so we're actually going in and creating a training to train Roma parents how to prepare their children to succeed in school. And for those of you that are educators, you'll understand what I mean when I say we're literally talking about taking two, two sticks and beating them together and making rhythmic music because it actually connects things in their brain they'll need later on. Or we're actually going in and teaching parents how you can just take these blocks and begin to teach your kid how to build things because it actually helps their brain develop. In fact, we're told that by the time a child is six, if they've not been involved in what's called creative play, they will have trouble learning the rest of their lives. So between the prejudice and the fact that the parents just don't have the resource or the knowledge or whatever to help these kids, this is what happens. I want you to see this video. It's not the greatest video quality. And if you just bear with me for five minutes, I'll be done. Could you do that? Thanks. Interview a teacher. And I know that said Czech. And we're working at another place called Koichin in Czech. Situation's the same as in Slovakia. They interview this teacher. And she's a teacher of a special needs class. And she acknowledges that while some of her students are special needs students, not all of them are. Well, the reporter tells you the real story. There's one special needs child in the class. What all the, other, what all the children have in common, however, is that they're all Roma. So that's how we're going to go make disciples. We're going to make disciples of the parents 
because we're sharing the gospel with them. We're going to make disciples of non-Christian Roma by going in there and saying, we want to help you with your children. And we're going to go in and make disciples of children by helping them know Jesus and know that Jesus actually is the answer, not just for their spiritual life, but for their life right here and right now. All I can do with you today is encourage you to pray for us. We don't know what we're yet going to face. We don't know that we, ha- we know that we don't have all the answers. But then personally to ask you what you're going to do in your own life, in your own community, in your own church, to be about making disciples. We cannot continue to have 80% of us doing so little work when really it's so simple to follow Jesus' call to go and grow, to go and, make, to go and testify, and to go and make disciples. Could you just pray with me this morning? Lord, I'm thinking today of these students who are graduating. And I'm thinking of the fact that all of them are wondering about their future. And Lord, I'm hoping and asking that all of us in this room will think about our future, the future of the people that we live with, the future of the people that we work with, And, Lord, the future of the people who need to know Jesus. This church, Lord, it really has been and continues to be a beacon, a lighthouse. Lord, we'd have to be honest. All across even Indiana, as many great churches as there are, we've still only scratched the surface. But what if every one of your children would simply go and share the simple touch of God they've experienced in their life? And what if all of us would be about the practice and the purpose of seeing new believers come and grow and mature in Jesus Christ? We thank you, Lord, that you can use us, and we thank you for the call to go in Jesus' name. I'm just standing here thinking about last week. Does anyone remember what? Uh-oh. I'm putting you on the spot. Do you remember what I, what I shared last week? What was the title of the message? What was the subject of the message? Anyone remember? What was that? Justice. You think the Holy Spirit's saying something to us as a church? justice what is what does it mean to act justly well moldova czech and these other what bill and let me tell you i've I've known bill now for maybe over 10 years i don't know but i have heard out of his mouth more in the past year man i was just praying and the holy spirit just laid this on my heart we got to do something I've heard that, those words out of his mouth more in the past year than I have. And it's not that he didn't follow the Holy Spirit before, but there's just something fresh. I can sense something fresh stirring in Bill and Linda right now. And uh, we get to be a part of that. And by uh, acting justly, is it just, is it right? Is it the right thing every time that there are students stuck in a special needs class, that there's a whole group of people that can't even find a place to worship is that just? Is that right? Of course it's not. What can we do to help? Well, we can, we can go for sure. In fact, I think Megan's brother, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law are actually going with Bill but on that trip here in a couple of weeks. But the other thing we can do is we can pray. Bill and Linda are one of our, our strategic missionaries. Just really want to encourage you. Let's continue to pray. And in a moment, we're going to pray over them. And we're going to pray over this, this new area of ministry to the Roma. The third thing we can do is we can just give. And I know you just gave in an offering last week. I know that to a missionary. In fact, you gave amazingly generously last week. I mean, just like over the top generously last week. I'm not even going to tell you right now how much it was, but I was just like, 
I almost wanted him to count the offering again. Yeah, really? <laughs> you guys gave very generously last week. But I just want to encourage you. Um, I'd like the ushers to come. I want to give you an opportunity right now to sow into the ministry of Bill and Linda. We, we, we bless them every single month with monthly support. When I say we, I should say you. You bless them on a regular basis. And so what I just encourage you to do, whatever the Lord would lay on your heart, you know, this is a missionary, this is an offering, anything the Lord would lay on your heart to give. Maybe you didn't come prepared to give. You can fill out an IOU on an envelope, say, put your name on it, IOU, I'll bring it next week or whatever. Or you could even right now on your smartphone or your very cool iPad, if you need bills, he, he'll give it to you. Um, or even later on this afternoon, if you just go get home, you can go online, pathwayag.com. On the right-hand side of the, of the screen is online giving. You can give. Just make sure you mark it for Bill Howell or somehow so that we'll know that. But everything we give right now is going to go completely to Bill and Linda. And just as an affirmation of um, we're behind you and we, we want to be there for you and, and encourage you. Can we, can we pray right now? Heavenly Father. God, I just sense right now this moment is about more than an offering. This moment is about more than an offering. God, even as Bill was sharing, God, I believe right now there are maybe three people here this morning that God is stirring you. You may be young, you may be old, I don't know. But God is stirring you to do something more. All of us are going to do something. Right now, we're going to give an offering. We're going to pray for Bill and Linda, and we do. And we're, we're supporting whatever. But there are three people here this morning that God is asking something more of you. I can't even tell you what that is. But God, I pray for that, those three people right now that you are placing a call, a good burden on them. And maybe even one day they're going to be involved. Jesus. I just keep your eyes closed for a moment. I don't want to over-spiritualize this at all. But I'm just telling you, in my heart, I believe something, a seed was just planted over the past 45 minutes in someone's heart here today. And Bill... And Linda are starting something that there are th at least three of you, there are people here this morning that you are going to continue even years from now. And I just want to affirm whatever it is the Holy Spirit's laying on your heart right now, it's the Holy Spirit. It may not be this year, it may not be next year, but it will happen. And you just receive, it may even be your children. God's birthing it in your heart to intercede for this because your children are going to be a part of reaching the world and reaching Moldova, reaching the Czech Republic in this area of ministry to the Roma people. And so God, I just, I just pray right now for those people who are here. God, just build their faith to believe. And God, some people are like, here, can we just take up the offering? But no, Holy Spirit, you are doing something right now. And God, confirm that, drive that deeper into their heart that that is you. And Lord, we just want to ask over um, Linda, especially this morning, as she grieves the loss of her father. Come on, church, pray with me. I just pray right now for Linda. I just pray peace over her. I just pray your grace. I just pray right now that you just, um, uh, even physically, just strengthen her as she continues in this grieving process. Her father lived a great life, but it's still a loss. And God, just be with her and Bill, Lord. God, bless their marriage financially every need they have um, for ministry god open doors close doors god i pray they would walk in a supernatural way like they never have before lord we ask your blessing on them in the name of jesus we pray and everyone said amen 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 falling on my knees go ahead guys falling on my knees in worship Giving all I am to seek your face Lord, all I am is yours Would you sing this? My whole life, my place in your hands God of mercy, humbled I bow down 
in your presence at your throne. Can you sing that part again? My whole life, my whole life. Stand and sing as we close. My whole life I place in your hands. God of mercy, humbled I bow down. In your presence at your throne. I call. I call, you answered, and you came to my rescue, and I want to be where you are. I call, I call, you answered. And I want to be where you are. I'd like those leadership team and if your wives are here, if they could come to staff, would you come and just come forward? And uh, we're going to pray for you. If you have any anything you'd like us to pray with you about, we're, um, uh, we'd love to do that and pray with you. If you'd like to come and just spend some more time in prayer, you're welcome to do that as well. Lord bless you. Thank you so much for coming this morning. If you'd like to continue just to worship with us, you're welcome to do that as well. I call. I call. Mm, I call. You answer. Whenever the Lord releases you, Lord bless you as you go. Wanna be where you are. And you came to my rescue and I want to be where you are. Falling on my knees, falling on my knees in worship, giving all I God of mercy, humbled, I bow down in your presence at your throne. I call, you answered. Thank you, Lord. And you came to my rescue and I want to be where you are i call i call you answer and you came to my rescue and i want to be where you are